Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the book launch of Wanjiru Koinange's debut novel, The Havoc of Chaos, presented by the Champaka Bookstore, which is an independent women-run bookstore based in Bangalore. It's also a children's library and a cafe. They bring together diverse stories and perspectives for readers and in their children's library through their books and events. They also run a small cafe for their community, spend a quiet few hours with a book and a hearty meal. Uh, I'm Joshua Moewa. I'm a Bangalore-based writer, poet, and columnist. And I'll be speaking to Wanjiru Koinage, who's a writer, restorer of libraries, and entrepreneur from Nairobi, Kenya. She was raised on a coffee farm on the outskirts of the city with her four siblings. She's got a bachelor's degree in journalism and literature. She also worked as a talent manager for some of East Africa's most renowned artists and musicians, and then as festival and events manager. She then went on to pursue a master's in creative writing, during which she wrote her debut novel, The Havoc of Choice. She had of chaos. Uh, yeah, she has right the oh. first time. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Havoc of Choice. She has created she has also created Book Bunk, an independent organization that renovates and manages some of Nairobi's public libraries, the Macmillan Memorial Library, and two of its smaller branches in Kaolo Lini and Makadara are the organization's flagship projects in restoring Nairobi's iconic public libraries. If this isn't enough, Wanjiru presently manages an artist in residence program which matches exceptional African artists with residency opportunities all over the world. Hi, Wanjiru. Hey, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> we made it. We made it to our first uh, Zoom uh, webinar event. Uh, thank you everyone else for joining us. Uh, thank you, Champaka, um, Nirika and Radhika. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, so let's uh, start off because we have so much to cover in the next 40 minutes and then we have a, we want to open it up to audience questions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, anyone in the audience, please type them out in the chat box and towards the end of this session we will go through them and read them and pick out a few and read them out. Uh, so I just want to start with, the, with this moment, I mean, as they say, start from the beginning. And this yeah. is a really uh, interesting moment in the book. And I thought that uh, it speaks to an, uh, to an element of the book that runs through the entire book, uh, which is that food is very central. That eating, sharing of food or what ingredients, you seem to mention these things constantly, what people are eating is very yeah. important to you. And the book start, uh, starts off with Kavata, the protagonist of the book, uh, making a very monumental decision after spending a whole day cooking a meal. And so I quite like this idea of like, I, I, like I was saying to you yesterday when we were having a brief catch up that uh, I would find it quite shocking if somebody, uh, if I had to make a meal and there was no one to, if I couldn't look at them eating it, you know, and, and live, bask in all the adoration, it would be very difficult for me to sustain myself. And so I found it really interesting that your character makes this choice. And so I'm just, I, so I would want to first talk about how you, how you landed on that scene firstly as the starting point of the book and how food is runs through the book in this really interesting way that I found I really liked. Thanks. Um, you've actually inspired me. At some point I'll read a, a section about food, but the, the thing about um, both the food and, and Kavata's decision to, to kind of um, have her, her story start with her leaving on this day when she's made this effort to create this big meal for her family was was really something that struck me 12 years ago when I began to write this book as much as it strikes me now um, that often when women are doing things that are kind of painful or like making big decisions like they're able to compartmentalize in like beautiful ways like I've been reading so many stories of women who leave their families for whatever reason for, for if it's for the for the better of the family or not but none of these women end up leaving like randomly no, no none of these women leave their houses and go and sleep on someone's couch we have these women who have made plans for months and they're able to just kind of do deal with the pain of the decision of leaving your family or your job or leaving your partner with the everyday and and most cases, most times, like stuff just goes on. Mm. So Kovata is busy making what is the biggest decision of her life at this point, or one of them, um, and she's making them um, and still is able to wrangle her family and get them ready for church on Sunday. And I think Sunday was an important place to start because they are my favorite days of the week. I think Nairobi 
on Sundays are the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh -huh. And then because um, this is the story about family, um, Sunday is the day when most people spend the day with their family. So Kavata living on a day that is um, so kind of pivotal for a typical Kenyan family, kind of, I guess it was, it was, it was strategic to kind of get the readers being like, how, why the hell would you do all of these things and then just uh, leave? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I wonder if you'd like me to read the section. Yes. Um, this is so I can warm into this conversation. Yeah. And this is very early in the book. This is kind of like first few pages in, and the story begins at church, as most Sunday, <laughs> as most Sundays begin for Kenyan families. Yeah. And um, this is right after church when the her and her family are now heading home for Sunday lunch. <clears throat> Kavata loved their home in Nyari, especially the way the house emerged almost out of thin air at the sharp turn to Red Hill Road. Their neighbors' well-manicured fences offered a lush green boulevard on each side of the tarmac as they continued up the road to their house. Greenery was very rare in Nairobi, until Wangari Maasai encouraged people to plant trees wherever they could. And with time, the air in the cities and the suburbs become a, became a few degrees cooler. When the family got home, Suo, their driver, opened the gate and let them in waving as they drove past. I didn't know Thor would be working today, Gugi, Kavata's husband, said, and Kavata gasped silently. She hadn't counted on Thor being early today. Neither did I, she said, grateful that Gugi wasn't looking at her. It's just as well, he can drive you to the club later. But Gugi was out of the house before she had even finished her sentence. The air was light and lovely, as was the conversation. Kavata served passion juice, cold mango, watermelon slices on the balcony of her, of her house before announcing that lunch will be served in under an hour. She worked swiftly in the kitchen. In the oven, potatoes were roasting in garlic and rosemary on a cooking tray over, above a large leg of boozy that had been cooking since the previous night and was now so tender that a spoon could slice through it. She stared at Ngugi through the kitchen hatch while she stirred some dania into the kachumbari. He had changed out of the stiff African shirt that he was wearing to church into a pastel yellow polo shirt that she had bought him a few years ago when he started playing golf. He'd been hesitant about the soft color at first, but all the compliments he got from his golf buddies changed his mind. Now he wore it so often that sometimes he hid it away for its own sake. Her husband looked so frustrated today, and she thought, and she she thought, and she wondered if her guests could see how much Ngugi deserved longed to be elsewhere. Her resolved weekend, but she reminded herself for the hundredth time that she had thought about this too long and too hard to abandon the ship now. She drizzled some lemon juice on kachumbari, dried her hands, dabbed the corner of her left eye with a kitchen towel, and strode back out to the balcony. As she replenished the tray of fruit by the table next to her guests, Kavata announced, please excuse me, I need to make a quick trip to the supermarket. We need something cold to go with a lovely lemon sponge cake that, that Scholar baked yesterday. I'll be back just now. Her voice quivered a little bit. Grace, the pastor's wife, lodged a half-hearted protest. Oh, I hope we're not too much trouble, Kavata. Please don't let us inconvenience you too much. But ice cream and lemon sponge cake, that does sound absolutely lovely. Oh no, not at all. I'm happy to. I'm happy to. I'll be back in no time and then we can eat, Kapata said to her house guests. I come with you, the pastor's wife asked. She mumbled as she dramatically scanned the ground around her feet for her handbag and Kapata panicked. Just as she was about to object, their husband stepped in. Ah, 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 please. No, 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 no. If the two of you go into a supermarket, it will be midnight before we see our meal. And me, I can smell some boozy buona, the pastor said, and everybody laughed. Kavata smiled, turned around and walked. Sorry, Kavata smiled, turned around and walked away before another word was spoken. Twende! Outside, her voice shook as she barked the order at Suo, who sprang off his seat and folded the newspaper he was reading. She spotted Amani, their son, running after her and cursed under her breath. Mommy, where are you going? To Nakumat, she said. Can I come? No, I'm coming back just now. You just go back inside and entertain the visitors. Yeah. But mom, those are your friends, not mine. Amani, listen to me, go back inside. Please, what are you going to buy? 
no, Baba, I'm only going for some ice cream. And if you keep fussing, I will come back with Mazira Mala instead of ice cream. I'll be back just now. Kabata slammed the door to the car and watched Hassan Salk as he returned into the house. Just like his father, she thought. It was only when the car came to a halt at the entrance of the supermarket that Kavata realized that she hadn't told Thu of their actual destination. She decided to go into the supermarket anyway. She had a few minutes to spare and was grateful for the time alone to catch her breath and think, think, and think things over one last time. The busy supermarket aisles gave Kavata a good distraction from her overcrowded thoughts. Something about watching shoppers go along with their normal lives, negotiating with their children over chocolate bars as their husbands decide which bear to spend their afternoon with. Something about that gave Kavata the emotional distance she needed to carry on with her plan. She walked out of the supermarket a few moments later with raspberry ice cream in her hand. She got back into the car and told Thu to take her to the airport. Which airport, madam? GKIA. Madam, we're going to the airport now. So you can have again in your money. So my, my visitors are none of your business. Please just drive. I think I'll stop there. I don't want to give away spoilers. <laughs> I think you're muted, Joshua. Let me unmute you. Oh, there we go. Huh. So I said, even in the, in the build up to this is the, is the lead up to the next thing that we wanted to talk about is this shift that you do between languages, right? There's this private, public language, personal, impersonal, secret, not so secret, right? Like there's a way in which each of these characters move between languages that do these things for them. I I had the ability to do this, to shift between the various languages that we speak, where certain languages are more for emotion or certain languages are more for anger, you know, expression of anger. Like, like I know, I know certain languages where I only know the bad words, you know, in a, in a very specific <laughs> way, you know. And so I, I really like that the characters do these things also, you know, that there's this way in which uh, each of your characters have, have this, even in the what you were reading now, right, the, the way that you describe these dishes, it's like either you're in it or not in it, right, and in some way, uh, your, my entry point to it is I felt it was something grand, you know, something that took a whole day to make, or, but I don't know the exact thing but I still know the effort or what you're trying to portray. So there's this way in which language does the, does this, uh, you know, sort of jumps between these two points in your constantly, I feel in the, in the book where it's, you know, it's between private, public, what can I say privately? What can I say publicly? Yeah. What is, what is personal? What is impersonal? So I can use another language for it. You know, what can I keep secret? What can, you know, and things like that. So I was really interested in, in how you, map that out in the book or do, is that something is that something you just took because that's a that's the surroundings around you it, it definitely is so i'll give you some context so i wrote this book when i was in cape town so i didn't live in nairobi when i wrote the book i had i had had i had actually fled nairobi because my father had passed away and i couldn't be in the city anymore and my sister had gone off to another country and i was like nope i'm going elsewhere so when i was writing this book um i had lost the sense of what Nairobi sounds like, both like the street sounds and what people talk like. So the first draft of this book was very rid of that language that you're talking about because mm. all I was hearing was South Africans talking English to me for the, for the four years I was rewriting the book. And when I gave it to an editor here, when I was trying to move back home, the first thing he said is you've lost, it doesn't sound like Nairobi. And that broke my heart because I wanted everybody who's grown up in Nairobi to recognize their aunties, uncles, to recognize the street signs, to recognize them, to feel that this was a book about their home. And I could only achieve that in, well, editing the book while I, when I had moved back home. And to answer your question, it's just the way we speak in Kenya. Kenya has 42 languages and maybe seven, no, 42 tribes and maybe 75 dialects. And no one ever speaks a complete sentence in English. Unless, <laughs> unless of course, you're speaking or you're in parliament, even in parliament, we don't. Yeah. But our, our, our kind of lingua franca is so mixed. Um, I speak English and Kiswahili. I, I lost my Kikuyu. I spoke a bit of Kikuyu. I lost it. And my mother went to school in, in, in Machakos, which is Kambalan, which is where a, a bit of this book is set. Yeah, and the MP scenes. Language. Yes, 
uh, yes, some scenes in, in Machakos, and she learned the language there. And then when we were growing up, our nanny spoke Kamba. So I realized when I was writing this book, how many words of Kamba I had picked up because of listening to my mom and my nanny speak for the first 12 years of my life. And that's the same for everyone who's been born here in the country, and not just in Nairobi, because there's such a richness of language here. And I think in most African countries, I, I'm sure in most African countries, because like you can't, I can't lie in a, in a certain language. I'm not gonna lie, it has to be in a language that I'm more comfortable speaking so I can lie more convincingly. Um, when I'm speaking to, to my sister, I speak a different way. It's English, but it's a different English than the one I use with my mom, um, than the one I use when I'm talking to, to the book one team. So it's, we dance around language so interesting and some of those languages aren't even, you can't write them down. We, we had an experiment <laughs> a few months ago where we're doing some work around the libraries and we tried to translate an English survey into Sheng. Sheng is our kind of like our what's what's the like informal language it's an informal language, so a mixture of everything. Okay. But Sheng is a spoken language. When you try and translate it, it just looks like gibberish. And and even <laughs> people who have grown up speaking Sheng were just like, we don't know what this is. Um and, and I think that there's beautiful times when I've read something and there's just something the writer has said that I know is special. And maybe the writer is coming from India or from Nigeria or somewhere else and you know it's special because English just failed, <laughs> and yeah. you can see other language to carry it. And I think that's one of the ways that I, I probably spent the most time on that because I wanted people to feel like the book described their homes and their lives and their aunties and their family members and their realities at into in two thousand and seven. And I think that's a great like entry point for like even uh, like a non African reader, you know, it, it, because in the sense or a, in a way like we would like we were saying, I say a non Western reader, I guess, in some way, yeah. right? Like because there's a way in which even in the Indian subcontinent or where we're from right now, we speak and we, we shift through languages in, in, in different ways or language functions in different ways or comes to our service in different ways. And so I found that really interesting in, in the book and how, for example, there's a scene and not to give away anything, but Tuao's father and him have this exchange of where language suddenly marks a difference between them, you know, that the father suddenly speaks a language because after a long time because he suddenly remembers home, you know, and there's a way in which uh, a similar way, you know, like uh, my grandfather wouldn't speak Malayalam for the longest time. He wanted us to speak English and Malayalam is from the uh, language from Kerala, the st uh, southern state in India. And he would, but, but towards the end of his life when he was growing, or when he was much, much older, he was, he regretted that he didn't teach all of us Malayalam. So, because he wanted to speak to us in a very particular kind of way or in an emotive way. And English didn't, uh, didn't hold, didn't hold his emotions, you know, he couldn't, yeah. couldn't ho hold his emotions for him. So I found these little bits really interesting in the book. And I think it's a great, uh, like, it's a great skill to be able to do that, you know, to still include your language and, uh, and still try to, uh, it seems like it captured the sound of the place to me. Like, I hope it did. I truly, truly hope. And I guess I can, I can, I'll only find out when the book is here and, and, and Kenyans can read it, but I really hope it did. I, I think that, um, the, and that's the reason why stories are so important. Stories that are yeah. written by and for you and, 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 and represent your reality because you, like, it's, it's a shame that we still have people growing up without having read, without having read books where they recognize themselves. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just such a juicy thing when you, when you get it right, when, when um, you can transport people. And I worried about that for foreign readers because there's a lot of, of English and Kiswahili and, and some Kikuyu and Kamba in the book as well. And I worried about if we would lose readers who weren't in Kenya. And, and um, my East Africa publisher, who's probably on this call, she and I kind of went back and forth a lot about whether we should italicize the yeah. non-English words and it's I mean it, it's trendy now not to and I, I kind of wish I hadn't because then you other the other languages and like in yeah. Kiswahili is not the other language English is the other language and everything yeah. else is the other language but not not Kiswahili so ideally it felt like a bit of a cop-out to be italicizing um the Kikuyu and, and Kiswahili words in the book but it's probably something I'm gonna do differently in the in the second edition but because of how many they were um I think it was it was it was it was important that I, that I do it for this edition, but I think that it's something we must begin to question when we question how we, the, the values we place on English as a language versus all the others. Yeah. And also the fact that in some way, like, I feel like we're also trained to read for certain Western literature, right? Where we don't, we're not, we don't train ourselves by reading more non-Western literature to be able to read differently. 
So we expect it to be sort of sanitize the language or, to, or you know, things like that. Well, when I, I like that the language here is tussling with something, you know, it's, it, it, it shows that not, not, all, not all language is complete, that there has to be some borrower or some, you know, for it to okay. fully express what you want to say. Not all language is complete. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, another thing that I really found, another theme that goes uh, in this uh, book, and I find uh, that plays out a lot in this book, is this idea of family versus individual. And mm -hmm. we were sort of discussing this as well. Yes, and I found, like, I find this interesting that in most uh, developing countries and non-Western countries, to be an individual is a very difficult uh, uh, demand of oneself because we're so uh, entwined or so woven with the fabric of family that it's kind of hard to say, I'm this color in this carpet, you know? Yeah. It's very yeah. difficult to point exactly how you contributed to something because you're so intimately woven. And it seems like this book is, is constantly making that tussle, right? Kavata with her father's political past, Vanya with her father's political uh, present, uh, you know, uh, Tua with, Tua with his, uh, where he, with his ideas of loyalty, you know, loyalty to the family that he thinks have taken him, take him on as a family. And also the family that is his family, you know, that his wife, his kids, you know, should he be loyal to them? So there's this constant idea of like, you know, though everyone is trying to be an individual of, or is portraying themselves to be an individual, or even like how you have uh, Kavata's friends, they, they come, sort of come in as characters that, uh, that act as sounding boards, you know, or ask societal questions, even if they're supportive of her, they sort of like ask her the questions that someone who didn't, who's not supportive of her might ask her so she can defend them. You know, so there's this way in which you're constantly also like, for me, those like her defenses felt like defenses of individualism, but, but she's still constantly having to remember her family. So I'm, I'm, I like this battle. It seems like a, you know, like a hero story, but a hero story that where the hurdles aren't like dragons or whatever, but they're just like your own past, you know, <laughs> coming on to haunt you. And so I like this move that you made. And I was wondering like, how did you go about creating that? Uh, and it's something that I think that in India we experience a lot and we don't talk about enough is like this idea of how, in, like how we are so attached to our families, but yet we all want to be seen as individual and we don't understand how much privilege or non-privilege the attachment brings with it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's such a, again, it's, it's such a thing that we're, we're torn by. And maybe, maybe it's a thing that my generation more than any, and, and I, I could be, shooting myself in the foot completely by saying this, but it's a tussle that we feel when it comes to like um, the religion versus the cultural, and then you add the political, and for, and for Kawasa, the political is even more real because um, my reality is that my fa I was raised Christian, and I was also raised um, to, to kind of honor and respect my Kikuyu customs. But even with my family being, my, my parents were very modern, they, took, they were all about the education and get go to school, but also when, when it's appropriate, you must stick to custom and traditions. And it's just like this dancing around that we do between like who you are, who you want to become, who your country thinks you should be, who your, who your religion thinks you should be, who all of these people think you should. And for Kavasa having a scenario where she's grown up in, with privilege, basically, she didn't ask for it, she, yeah. she didn't, didn't like it. She actually has spent her entire life trying to get away with it. Um, and it just keeps coming back at her. And when she finally finds someone to take her away, to take her away from it, it comes back. And she's forced, she's forced to, to, to figure out, am I going to be this guy's wife? Am I going to be a, a wife to my, a mother to my children? Am I going to be a, a first lady? Am I going to be um, this woman who ran away? W what, what of my realities are, am I going to, am I going to embrace? And I think that it's, I, 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 she, she doesn't. I, I don't think that she solves her her conundrum. I think she kind of leaves it hanging because the, yeah. the I think the fatal flaw for, for Kavata and I, it's difficult. That when I read this book, I'm trying to give out spoilers, is that she has all of this privilege, but doesn't recognize that even if she didn't ask for it, it's hers, and she can run away from it. That's fine. You can, and I, I think it's possible to like discard privilege if you want, but most most often it's very difficult to. So she loses the important the importance between not shining privilege, but kind of just what you, what you do with it. Um, yeah. 
what you do with it because I, I can't change where I was born and who, who, who raised me and the kind of life that they gave me because that was that was what my parents did to do the best for me and there's some people who ideally you can't take that silver spoon out of your mouth if it's, if you were born with it and so it's what you do with it um, that matters that's what Kavasa completely misses because she doesn't understand that when you're somebody with privilege your life is attached to so many other people's lives in a way that you that if you're blind to then you end up um being one of those people who is using their privilege in a completely wrong way and not not being in intuitive about what your decisions can do what your choices and all of the havoc they can do mean for the ecosystem of people around you yeah uh, another way that this uh, sort of dichotomy plays out is class plays a big, big, uh, big role in uh, in uh, in the book. Uh, I'm wondering if you want to talk about that, and because I also like that you don't just make it a class between like the upper class and the the working class, the divide, but there's this very uh, is these snide moments that I found very uh, very insightful where where even Shola, the housekeeper, and Thor, the driver, have little uh, problems with each other. And so in, in the way that class plays out, because she thinks he's the driver and she's the housekeeper, so he's outside and she gets to be inside. So she still treats him differently. So there's these various ways in which you sort of show us how class works out. And also the way that influence of you know, who's rich, who knows who, you know, the corruption that you're trying to map out is also a lot has to do with class, right? And so, and I think in India, especially, we, we have a lot of class, con we have a lot of class problems, but we don't talk about them. We try to, uh, we try to sweep it under the rug of meritocracy. And we say that, oh, they, they're here, so they made it and they deserve to be here. We don't see how they got there. And so, but in your book, you sort of map that out for us. And I, I like that uh, play between, uh, you know, class, uh, the various uh, machinations of how, pe how, how people have to move around in society with their class, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, what class gave them. You know, in some way. Yeah, yeah. The question of class is probably the entire reason that I wrote this book. Um, when I when I moved to SA to do my master's, I planned to write a book about my father. Actually, the plan was to write my father's memoir. Um, because I was heartbroken, he died, and I wanted to write a <laughs> book that would memorialize him for the, forever and ever and ever. I still will, I just wasn't ready then. <laughs> but the reason I wrote this book then is because when I moved to that, South Africa, everybody kept asking me um, how we were doing as a country. They're like, how are you guys doing? Oh, you're from Kenya. How are you? Oh, Kenya. Oh, shame, Kenya. And this was in 2012 or 2011, so it was at least five years since the violence had happened. But for people who'd watched the news from my father, were just like, you guys can't be okay after going through what you went through. And I began to think about what it was like for me living in Nairobi at the time to go through 07. Um, at the point, I, at that time, I lived in the north of Nairobi at my parents' house. Or were we at my parents' house? I can't remember. But I was in a part of Nairobi that was barely touched by the violence. And my biggest inconvenience was that I couldn't go to the liquor store to buy myself some gin. Now, 15, like hundreds of people <laughs> had died. Like the country has, was experiencing the worst violence since independence and I couldn't buy myself some gin. And that began to like, I began to remember that when I was in South Africa and be like, how could that be the reality? And then we just accepted and moved on so swiftly like we do so well in Kenya because again, it was easy for people to say accept and move on because the people up here didn't get their houses burnt down. So they want yeah. to keep things, so we don't ask the questions about how this could happen in our country. And for, for, for instance, the class thing is so, it becomes realer for Kavasa because she realizes that when she makes the decision to do what she does, the, the ripple effects affect everybody. Like there's nothing yeah. about you being a privileged person in, I think it's the same in your world, but in my world, if you're privileged, you have a driver, you have a cook, you have a nanny, you have all of these people who rely on your, your life for well-being. So when you up and leave, you're uprooting <laughs> their well-being. But I didn't think about, and that's the height of privilege. And I think the class thing was was the, the biggest thing. And it's the thing I will continue to investigate. And just to be, to be, to even now, and with with COVID happening, it's just it's, it's shocking how working from home is not that's a privilege. And it's something we keep saying, but I don't know if we if we're getting used to actually thinking about what these things mean. If you don't have your housekeeper come and clean your house because you can't because there's no people are supposed to be working from home, that means she doesn't have a way to feed her family that evening. Um, I don't think that people who are in the kind of positions that, that hold this power think about it often. I think yeah. that the people who lost their homes and are still displaced all of these years later um, are that way because they just don't need the power. And we, we, I wanted this book to address that and to, and to hold 
the reality up into, into people's into people's faces. So they can remember that these this this thing that happened that changed us so so deeply and we still have some level of national PTSD around can happen again because we don't we, we put band-aids over problems and we we tell people accept, build the economy and we must move on, we must do better, but the people at the top aren't doing better. They're really not. And uh, that's an interesting thing. The people on the top are not doing any better. No, they're not doing better. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to give away anything from the book, but I really like, I, I want to say to the people who are on here that reading the book is, uh, is this insight into these, very, into these four topics that we sort of pick to play around with. But there's so much more, like, in the sense that I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this women writers, women book uh, logic, you know. But I find that, I, I found that that was a, like, it was, it's too simplistic to do that because it, it's not like, uh, you're not, it's, you're not writing only for women. You're writing a book for everyone to read. You're just picking somebody, a woman character to lead us through it. And I quite like that. Uh, and so, I mean, there are various ways, machinations of how women move through spaces as well in the book that you show us. But I didn't, I don't want to focus on that because in some way then it ends up being this uh, women writers defending uh, women's uh, interior lives and such conversations. So I think I'll save you from that. And uh, so, uh, and uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, touch upon before we open up to questions. So if anyone has a question, now's the time to go to that chat screen and start typing those questions out. Uh, you, uh, why don't you tell us a little about these, uh, this uh, book bunk and building libraries and the work that you've been doing around it in Kenya? Yes, sure. Um, so, Book Bank is, is an organization that I co-founded with Angela Washuka, who's probably on this call. Um, um, and we started the organization three years ago um, officially, but it's been in our hearts for about seven years. And it's simply because we walked into a library um, one day in 2011 and the library was completely neglected. It had barely any services. Um, the employees were, under, were, were demotivated. It had no collection of books, no toilets, nothing. And we were looking for a space to hold a gig then, but um, we couldn't believe that N Nairobi's oldest library, uh, the most, one of the most beautiful buildings we have in the city had been neglected in that state. So fast forward two years, we find some partners and we find um, some people to join our board and we create Bookbank. And the, the reason why Bookbank, obviously like we can, we can talk for hours about the importance of libraries and I don't think anyone on this call <coughs> doubts the importance of libraries, but I think <laughs> Why, why that this work means everything to me as somebody who wants to spend her life writing is I think we've been told um, erroneously that it's okay to focus on the art and not worry about where the art goes to live. If you're Beyonce, maybe, but even Beyonce didn't start that way. <laughs> We can't, we can't just spend our lives writing books and assume that the gods of literature will take them and make them grand. And when I began to look, about, look at the place that I want to spend my life writing books, which is the Nairobi, and what the ecosystem of literature is, I'm just like, I can't rely on book sales or, my, or, my, or like bookstores, rather, for my well-being. We need to put the books that people want to read in places that people want to read them. And in an economy like ours, we can't have people paying $20 a pop for a book. So I began to think about how can I make my book available for free and libraries became the most um, logical um, space. Of course, commercially, it's not the answer, but I truly believe that when you begin to create palaces for literature and all of the arts, so you begin to, to, to kind of feed the appetite for this knowledge and make it as accessible as possible, then we begin to see things shift with, um, with the way people think about the arts and where the arts must live and, and what distribution looks like for, for writers. Um, Another thing that broke my heart is that, um, and I'm not in any way trying to shift on the publishing industry, but I think that writers don't get enough money for their work. And I know that's a, it's a decision that publishers make because it has to make money. Books are expensive to produce. The like publishing is, is a really very small and very competitive industry, but I think it's, it's completely heartbreaking to have artists, writers getting 20% of their, of their royal, or 20% of the value of sales coming back to them. And I wanted to, assess like what why this happened and the only way to do it was to was to get into it so we then decided to, to set up a for-profit arm of bookbank which is then goes into publishing and tries to figure out how these two things can work together we haven't by any standards figured it out my book is kind of the first the first of two books we're putting out this year um and and trying to connect these two things that that have been connected 
for so long, but I don't think very deliberately so. I don't think that we've thought about libraries as dis distribution, distribution points for art. And that's why Book Bank is so important. Um, and, and that's why it's giving us such joy um, with the work that we're doing because we're, 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 bringing, we're bringing life to these spaces and showing people that you can use them for anything you want to. If you want to have a, a, a session with a lawyer to learn how to control your intellectual property, come to the library. If you want to read a book by Kenyan author, come to the library. If you want to just escape Nairobi's traffic, come to the library. And then we begin to have all of these wonderful, thing, wonderful things happen when you invest in public spaces, you invest in storytelling, and you invest in the city's creative. Uh, I think we're getting some questions. Sorry, I was just looking at the screen and just for yeah, a second. Okay. But, uh, But I really like this idea of like creating a space like it, that uh, it also seems like a generous uh, offering by a writer, you know, uh, as a writer myself, uh, I don't, wouldn't uh, think that I want to create a, like, I, I think it's someone else's task to do all this, you know, but it's uh, very laudable that you have taken this upon yourself to do this, I must say that, like, because it, it's a big deal to, uh, to want to create a, uh, to create a field for something to grow, right? Rather than to, to just think, why isn't it there? So I, I think it's a good task. Congratulations on that. Thank you. We've got to treat our act like a business. We have to. It needs to be like, like it's your business. It's your, if I want to spend 12 years working on a book, I want to make sure that it sells, that it has the most, it has the most beautiful cover you can have, and it has, a, it has a best chance of reaching the people it was intended for. And I think that, that's why both Book Bank and Bank Books were important um, for the both of us. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to some questions from questions. the people who are here. Maybe some comments just to start with. Uh, John Conwell says, the impact of colonialism and the power the colonial languages still hold. I think he was talking about when we were talking about language. Very true, the violence was controlled by the elite and found, uh, fought by the masses. Thousands of them died. Hundreds of thousands were displaced. Many thousands of women were raped. More than a decade later, no one has ever been held accountable. Many of them in top leadership positions still. I think this uh, speaks very true of our country too. So uh, yeah. I think it's an important lesson. It's so uh, frustrating, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Wamuyu, I think that's her name. Sorry, I might be getting it completely wrong. Uh, what do you think is the solution for writers making money, especially in Kenya? Do you think, think writers can make money from just writing? Most writers have to run other programs outside of writing. So what do you think is the solution for writers making money, especially in Kenya? An incredible question, um, and it's one that I love to answer because I, if I could make money off my writing, I would, I would. <laughs> I <can't laughs> exist, and all of the side hustles I have, I would spend my days writing. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I know very few people who've done that, and I think that the, the, the short answer is get a job that makes you write. So if, you, if, you, if it's ad agency work, it's it's whatever copywriting work you can get, it's writing blogs, whatever. But I also know that I'm speaking in a country where we have a mad economic crisis. So I think the best thing I can do is say that there's, there's, there's certain things that make writers excel. So for instance, to become a, a writer, or to write, you have to have mad discipline because it's difficult to sit at a desk and write. And Joshua, I'm sure you know this. <laughs> so that discipline, I think you need to just kind of lay out all of the traits that you have that enable you to write. For me, it's, it's discipline. For me, I'm, I'm a very organized writer. I lay everything out and I want to see where everything is going and I want to I wanna organize my writing and kind of look at your craft and look at the things that make your craft good or the things that make your craft uniquely you. It could be virtues like patience and, and organization and diligence, all of these things, and then see where else they're, they're applicable. Because I have learned that, I've learned that there's nothing as somebody who's bad at her job. It's wrong people in the wrong jobs. And I think that when writers try and do like gigs, most writers end up being introverts like I am. And then if you're going to be an introvert and go and think of a career and I don't know as a tv star or something that requires you to be out all the time then you're kind of treating yourself in the foot and other you wouldn't be able to write but I also always um found work that allowed me the kind of silence and and control over my time that meant that I could wake up at five in the morning and write until eight and then go to my eight to five or whatever 
So I think you need to be very um, um, critical about your skills, audit your skills and see how are these skills transferable because we're not in the economy where you can, you can make your money off writing. I don't think even the greatest writers in Africa have been able to just live off their writing. Some of them teach, most of them do other work. Um, and I think it's okay because because it's just, <laughs> it's a lot in life. And if you don't want to do it, then perhaps consider another, another um, career. But I definitely think that there are skills that writers have that se separate them from many other professionals in the world. And you need to harness those for yourself and see where they're applicable. My organizational skills means that I can run projects um, very well. So I am good at seeing big picture things. And now because I can see where the, end, the story is ending, I can look at all of the pieces that need to take, all the characters that need to take my story there. And that is applicable in any project you can, whether you're building a library or you're planning a gig or you're trying to create like a, a, a response plan for COVID, you just need that kind of big picture and detailed thinking. Um, but you need to do a lot of kind of self auditing to arrive at that place. Um, and, and, it, and it took me about five years to figure out how I can create the job world that I want. I I never saw myself doing anything conventional and I hate the idea of someone else being in charge of my time. Um, but I also understand that if I want people to give me control over my time, I have to deliver <coughs> I have to deliver on time and that way they'll be like, she was good. She'll, she'll do her thing on time. <laughs> do you um, want to, everyone has been asked saying that they really like the reading extract. So you want to read something else? Okay. It's closing. Oh, I hope we're not, well, I guess, Chapaka will tell us if we need to get out of here. Yeah. I think we have another 15 minutes or so. Okay. I'll read something else from pretty early in the book so I don't spoil it. And this is the day after, it's Monday. Yeah. And um, kind of so is going to work, is reporting to work and um, has no idea what he's going to find when he gets there. <clears throat> Sewell had a confident spring in his step as he left the house the following day. He'd even made love to his wife, Chapto, despite the fact that they'd had an argument about Ngugi and the election. Who is going to vote for a man who can't get his own wife to support him? Aish, what's wrong with that woman anyway? How can she refuse to stand with her husband during the campaign? Lazima kuna kitu alifanya because if I were her, I would become his second shadow. Chepto glued her chest to Thuo, who playfully peeled her off him and brushed her away. It had taken a few years for Thuo to assert his authority as a man of the house. It didn't help that he had married a woman who was slightly larger than him and with a much bigger personality. It was a thing that he loved the most about his wife, that she was capable of taking care of herself. However, she was completely blind to situations where she needed to let him roar. He had resorted to just telling her when to simmer down, and on most days it seemed to work. Chapto's strong opinion about Kavata's choices was always the beginning of a fight, and he wasn't going to fall for it. Not today. Today was going to be a good day. He could feel it. And maybe whatever big surprise Kavata was planning for Gugi meant that she was finally coming around to the idea of the election and Gugi winning it. He was thinking about all of the ways his life will change in just under a week when Gugi won the election. If Gugi won, Thor reminded himself. Thor reminded himself not to be too confident. Things could swing both ways. But Gugi would win, he thought, and he made a mental note to check the final election polls as soon as he got to work. Each time he walked past a campaign poster that bore the smiling, reassuring face of his employer, Thor grew a little more joyful. He pictured himself wearing a nice gray suit and tie, driving a minister around like he had done several years ago when he had his short stint working for Kabata's father during his final term in office. It just so happened that Ngugi and Kabata were in need of a driver after Muli retired and Thuo had accepted the job despite the slight pay cut. His sacrifice was finally paying off. He said a quick prayer for gratitude as he walked around the corner that led to Ngugi's house. What did you do? Scholar was waiting for him at the gate, and she hissed the moment she saw his, the moment she saw his slender figure approaching the house with a blade of grass dangling from his lips. She shoved him behind a bush outside the house, and it took it took Thor a moment to wrangle himself out of the older woman's grasp. Ah, ni ni wewe. So there are, there are policemen in there with him there. She swiped the strand of grass away from his mouth and used it to point towards the house. 
Mama Wanja has not been home since yesterday, and they're saying it's you who took her. What happened? Mama Kawapi, I don't know where she is. Who raised his voice, and he quickly checked himself. Although Kola wasn't old enough to be his mother, he'd always treated her with the same level of respect. He had worked for the she had worked for the Ngugis for much longer than he had, and it was mostly because of that that Flo still had a job. Scholar had seen so many workers come through the Ngugi residence, but had, had never endorsed any of them. But Thuo, she guided him through his first months of work and regarded him as a son. She often defended him whenever he would slip up and convinced their employers not to fire him. This was something Thuo never took for granted, despite the occasional arguments they would have when Scholar insisted on telling him how to do his job. Thuo was sure that of all of the people was sure that she of all people would be able to see right through him if he tried to lie to her. He had given Kavata his word. He would stick to it. His loyalties were slightly challenged, but he would stick to it. And, she, and he knew that once, that she, was, once she was finished with, the, with the, whatever she was planning for Ngugi, she would be back home with an explanation. Listen, scholar, me, I took her to Mrs. Agalo's house, I brought the car back, and I went home for my off day. So we'll switch to Kiswahili. It was easier to tell a lie in a local language. The look in her face said that he had failed to convince her. He tried again. They came home from church. They had visitors. I took her to Nakomat, and then I took her to Mrs. Agalo. She told me to bring the car back home and then to go home. That's what I did. If she didn't come back, Miss Ijiri, the concern on his face was real, and Skola could see that he wasn't lying. She walked towards the house. Mzai told me to tell him when you arrive. I hope you're speaking the truth because I have had him telling the police that you are responsible for, her, for Mama Wanja's disappearance. I hope you haven't put yourself in problems. I can't fish you out of this one. Skola, why would I come back here today? Come on, Ime Fanyakitu. If I'd done something wrong, I would have run away. And before he said that, he spun around and walked through the gates, oblivious to what he would find waiting for him. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, does anyone else have any questions? Please put them up in the chat uh, chat box, the chat screen. I don't know how to say these technical terms, but just type it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the clap, the vigorous claps. Um, <laughs> what are you reading now, Joshua? Oh. Uh, uh, I was reading uh, this uh, this uh, Kenyan writer <laughs> Wanjiru Konyangi. <laughs> yeah, did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> Just a few days ago, yeah. <laughs> I should. Uh, you, should you should you should really get you should really get that book. It's it's re <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> and then I've been reading uh, Olivia Lang. Lang mm -hmm. is that how you say her name? L a i n g. Yeah. This. Uh, uh, lonely city. That's what I've been. Uh, yeah, besides this, yeah. Um, uh, I, what are you reading now? And would you like to show us the three books you're reading? I, well, I'm reading this other, the one you mentioned about the writer. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna remind myself, like, <laughs> to everybody. Oh, that's the cover, everybody. <laughs> that's the cover. So I, I, I read once in a while, and then I'm also mm. reading. This is required reading at Bookbank. So it's called um, Palaces for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life. Um, so we all got this for Christmas at Bookbank, and we are reading it this month so we can discuss it. We try and read the same thing and listen to the same podcast just so we can see what libraries look like anywhere ever else in the world. And I'm reading poetry as well. This is by a, one of my newest friends, actually. Her name is Donna Ogunaike. She and I spent, um, gosh, before COVID, when the world was different and we could travel, um, Donna and I spent about eight weeks traveling across Africa um, um, for this project called Outfighters Africa. And our plan was to kind of see if two writers from different genres in different countries could, could see um, the same things differently. Um, and during this travel, we each were tasked to explore um, whatever facet of things in, were important to us uh, in those countries. So Donna was looking at um, how women are, are prepared for their bodies, basically, and I was trying to explore how 
how young people are meeting in an internet age. Are people hooking up online? Mm. How are they dating? How are they finding each other? And all of this is supposed to be towards some book number two, but I'm currently reading Donna. Um, it's a book of poetry. I think it's available in most places, and I think you should all get it if you can. Um, so I read this before I sleep, and I read this when I wake up. <laughs> What's the book, a poetry book called? The poetry book is called A Different Kind of Broken. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, someone is asking what it's called. It's, yeah. A Different Kind of Broken by Donna Ogunaike, and she's from Nigeria. Um, you should get some of these to Champaka as well. I'll, I'll connect Donna and Enerika and Radhika. That'll be great. So before everyone logs off, I want to say that the Havoc of Choice is exclusively available at Champaka in India. Purchase it on their online store, champaka.in. So I'm going to say that again. The Havoc of Choice is exclusively available at Champaka. Purchase it on their online store, champaka.in. Do you want to tell us where the book is available anywhere else? Yes, um, so the book is currently available in the UK via Jacaranda Arts and Books. We're going to put this in the chat. Jacaranda Books in the UK are shipping to most places um, within the UK, and I think it's in Barons. And then in East Africa, um, the books are in Mombasa. It's taken like <laughs> months and months and months to get the books in, but they're in Mombasa, which is the Kenyan coast here. So they should be in bookstores within the month of June. They'll be in all textbook centers, they'll be on textbook center online, and they'll be available on my website if you'd like me to sign it and I'll sign it and ship it directly to you. Or if you know where I live, just come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that will all be um, within the month of June. So as soon as the books are available in, in Eastern Africa, I will shout. We are still trying to find publishers in other regions. The thing I'm learning about publishing as, as I do this for my book is that it's best to the easiest way to get books across the world is to get publishers in those regions. So if you're on this call and you're a publisher in the US or anywhere that's not East Africa or, um, or the UK, um, let us know if you want to share my book with your people. Hey, I want you to say a little more about this, uh, this uh, more love in Africa thing that you've been doing, if you wanted to send on that. <laughs> Actually, you and I need to have a, a, a longer conversation. So I read your article about dating, and I was like, we can have a long conversation. Yeah, it was. So, Outfighters Africa is a project of the Edinburgh Book Festival, and they paired 10 writers. And as I mentioned, you go across, and each of us selected the countries we wanted to be in. And then um, the thing that I discovered is that, first of all, um, people are using online platforms to hook up. So, I went to Gambia, Senegal, Nigeria, Botswana. Um, Gambia, Senegal, Nigeria, Botswana, yeah. And in every, each and every one of those countries, the, the, the kind of mix of what people are using was different. So in Gambia, it was mostly people kind of sliding into the DM on Facebook and on LinkedIn and kind of no one's using Bumble and, and Tinder, but they're all sliding into the DM on the social media apps. It was very different in Senegal where um, Tinder was, was really popular. I got catfished in Senegal also. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's also there's, there's the the there's lots of people hooking up in Senegal, but it's very, very under the radar. Um, and then... And is this going to feed into your next book? This is for the next book, because I want to write a love story next. I want to write a wonderful, hilarious, um, and raunchy love story. So this was research. Oh. <laughs> the next um, and I actually have a deadline in two weeks that I haven't touched, because I, I need to write a kind of short piece about the travels, which will be part travel writing and part um, kind of exploratory essay. Okay. Um, which is for the next two weeks um, working on. John Conwell has been kind enough to put up uh, the reviews of uh, the poetry book and the review of Palaces for the people in the chat in case anyone wants to quickly uh, look that up. Uh, I think we finished. We hit all the things we wanted to talk about. Is there anyone has any more questions? We have another like five minutes of uh, scheduled time. And thank you for all of the lovely wishes from everybody in the comment section. Yeah, everyone has been saying very nice things. Okay. Lots of claps vigorously. <laughs> Saturday evening, stroke afternoon, depending on where you are with, with Joshua and I. Do you think we should wrap up? I think we should yeah so i'll just wrap up by saying uh 
Thank you so much, Wanjiru, for doing this. Thank you for your book. It was uh, so exciting to read it in like less than four days and quickly uh, go through it. And I found it very exciting. And I think that this is a uh, this is a mental block we have generally in all the all the non-Western countries where we don't have our own literature or we don't read literature from across other non-Western countries where we somehow think that something that has been reviewed in quote-unquote quote a good newspaper in the, yeah. which basically means a Western newspaper is the only thing we should be reading. And so I'd encourage everyone to, uh, you know, uh, break that habit and step out and read more across your cultural lines or closer to your cultural lines in some way. And this is, uh, and Wanjiru's book is an amazing example of this sort of excitement and ability for you to connect with something without the idea that, uh, that, uh, so, uh, remember to buy so, and uh, support your independent bookstore. Yay. Thank you, Wanjiru. Thank you so much, Joshua. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you to Radhika. Thank you, Nerika. Thank you, Jayapriya, for making sure my books are in India and in India first before they are anywhere else. Um, so, yeah. Champaka happens to be the only place in the world that has my book at the moment. So if you're in Bangalore or in India, please order it and then write me to tell me what you think. And Nairobi, I know you've been wait patiently waiting. I have two um, any day now. Um, not Nairobi, Kenya and East Africa, actually. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you, Joshua, for the conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, everybody.